Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to talk about data as the driving force. And I thought that I'd start with an example of what data can do. The example actually is from my dear friend and co-author, Kenneth Cookier. Uh, and it has to do with something that you all are familiar with, namely with dessert. Now, if you look at the United States, when a typical American family is going shopping and they buy a cake, they buy a pie, what kind of cake, what kind of pie do you think they buy? Apple pie, yes. They buy apple pie. There's nothing more American than apple pie. Now, when you ask, however, the people whether they like apple pie or not, they say they don't like it that much. But still, they go out and they buy apple pie. So, large supermarket stores and groceries and retailers have produced apple pie, this big, nice apple pie, and families go in there and buy the apple pie and don't like it. That's kind of sad, but that's what the world looked like until very recently, when, in fact, large supermarket chains started to ask the people what they really like. And it turns out that some people like cherry pie, and other people like lemon pie, and the third kind of people like chestnut pie. But as families, they could never agree on what kind of pie they should buy. But they needed to buy a large pie because it was a family pie. So they agreed on the least common denominator, or the most common denominator, and that was apple pie. Nobody really liked it, but nobody hated it enough to object to it until they found out that that really was wrong. And so, what did the supermarkets do? They reduced the size of the pie. They didn't try to sell more of the apple pies. No, they understood that the problem was one that they were unaware of. The problem was agreeing among family members who should get the pie and who should choose what the pie was like. And so the consensus was the apple pie. But if you shrink the size of the pie, then everybody can get his or her favorite pie, which, when you implement it, as they did, dramatically increased revenues, because now you don't buy one buy pie, you actually buy a pie for each of the members in your family. As simple as apple pie it is to use data, except we haven't. The past is full of trying to make the most insights of the least amount of data available. In fact, we grew up and have lived in a world of small data. We're collecting and analyzing data was so hard and difficult and time-consuming that we collected as little as possible in order to make sense and answer a question that we had. That may change. In fact, that is changing. And the hope is that as it changes, we are going through a paradigm shift like this guy who looks out of the old paradigm into a new one because we have now data available rather than live in a data-impoverished world. It started with the internet and the digital revolution. Think about the large companies out there in the internet arena and how much data they actually gather. Twitter, for example, has 400 million tweets a day. 800 million YouTube users upload a hour of video every single second. So even if you stop sleeping, you never could watch all the video 
that is just newly uploaded on YouTube. 10 million photos are uploaded on Facebook every single hour, and Google processes petabytes of data every single day. Petabytes of data? What's a petabyte of data? What did you have for breakfast? A couple of petabytes? A petabyte of data is as much data as is in a book if you take not just one book, but a book in the library, and not just one library, but the largest library in the world, the Library of Congress. That's a petabyte if you multiply it by 100. That's what Google is processing every single day. The best guesstimate that we have on how much data we have in the world and how is that, that is growing shows us that the data has been increasing 100-fold in the span of 20 years, from 1987 to 2007. Right now, the data in the world is doubling about every 13 to 15 months. This is unprecedented in human history. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is really depicted by the two different colors here. The light pink is analog storage, and the, large, the dark purple is digital storage. If you look at the white little line there, the vertical line, that's the year 2000. In the year 2000, three quarters of data in the world was still analog. Three quarters. Today, it's less than 1%. So within 15 years, we have moved from an analog world to a digital world. Now, what does this do? What does this additional quantity do? Well, try to think about a metaphor, a way by which we could sense what we could do with this data. Think about photography. If you take a picture of a rider on a horse, it's just a picture of a rider on a horse. But if you take lots of pictures on a rider on a horse, in fact, suddenly this quantity turns into a different quality, namely movies. The hope of big data is the quantity of data, the additional amount of data that we have, turns into new insights into the world, into human behavior, and therefore into new economic value derived from that. Big data and the push towards data as a driving force means that we have more data available than ever before in the world. But it's not just the absolute number of data points. It's really how much data you have available about the question at hand, about the phenomenon that you want to study. If you want to understand your customer, it's about how much data you have about your customer. Again, let me, let me try and use a metaphor here. See, if I were to take a photograph of you here, as I'm doing right now, please smile, then I have to make a choice. And the choice is, who do I focus on? Do I focus on the gentleman in the first row here, or do, you focus, do I focus on the ladies in the table over there, at the table over there? The moment I take the picture, I need to make a decision. And the decision is about who do I focus on. If I focus on you, sorry, you will be blurry. You will be out of focus. And I can't go back bed later on and bring you back into focus. Now, why is this important? It's important because it means that before I take a photograph, I already need to know what is really important to me. If I don't, then I might end up with the important part in the photo being blurred. What if we could change that? What if we could change this restriction in collecting data? See, this is a photograph of a toothbrush. In the background, out of focus, you have my then three-year-old son. I can't bring him back into focus, can I? Well, actually, I can, because this photograph was not taken with an ordinary camera. This was taken with a big data camera or called a light field camera. Here it is, it's a Lytro. And because it's a Lytro, it captures all focal panes, it captures all light rays coming in. So I, after the fact, can click on my son and of course he comes into focus. Or I can click on the toothbrush and it comes into focus because all the data is there. And therefore, I can do 
what I couldn't do before. I can ask questions after I have collected the data and have them answered. I can, in other words, let the data speak. Now, with that, I can then do analysis. And this analysis oftentimes is called correlational analysis. This complicated word means actually something very simple, and that is you try to understand and to uncover seeming connections, patterns emerging in the data. So for example, Walmart, that you're all familiar with, Walmart collects a lot of transactional data about what people buy. And they did a big data analysis of what people buy, and they discovered that just before a storm comes, a heavy storm comes, people go to the Walmart and they buy batteries and flashlights. Of course, that's what I would buy. But then they did more analysis and then they discovered that people just before a storm hits a particular location, people also buy Pop-Tarts. Pop-Tarts is a sugary American snack Please note that I don't call it food that is available at Walmarts. And so they started looking at the data and they said, wow, people buy Pop-Tarts. Why are they buying Pop-Tarts? And in fact, buying strawberry Pop-Tarts. Why are they buying strawberry Pop-Tarts? And they did more and more analysis until one of the team members said, stop. The data does not tell us why people are buying stuff. The data only tells us what people are buying. And and quite frankly, pragmatically speaking, that's good enough. All that I need to know is what people are buying at a particular situation. And so the other team members at Walmart said, yeah, you're right. And since then, whenever a storm is approaching Walmart, the Walmart staff brings the Pop-Tarts closer to the checkout counter because that's what the people crave and want to buy. And Pop-Tart sales have gone up. Didn't know, didn't know why, didn't need to know. Why? Now, Amazon has been doing something similar. As you know, Amazon started in the 1990s originally selling books. And Jeff Bezos was a quant. He came from Wall Street. So he had the system, the, the, the website system, collect all kinds of data, not just transactional, but interactional data as well. And then he went to the best data analyst that he could get in the 1990s, and the marketing specialist. And he said, you know, guys, what would you do with the data? And they said, oh, that's easy what we would do with the data. We here have and know about 20 to 30 predefined categories of book buyers, like the, the mystery uh, reader, the crime reader, the single male who is interested in car, books, uh, the family who is interested in family and children's books, uh, the old elderly lady who is interested in gardening books and so forth. So we just get the customer data and then slot the customers into any one of those predefined categories. And then based on the category, we send them advertisements. And that was called recommendations based on predefined categories. And they put this system in place and then they let the customers use it. And when I interviewed, we interviewed an Amazon uh, manager who was in charge of this. He said that when he first used it, it was like going shopping with the village idiot. It was a really stupid, bad system because it knew enough to angry, to make you angry and to aggravate you, but it didn't know enough to actually make sense. So Amazon, through this old, small database, predefined categories-based system away, and they said, we'll use a big data approach. And the big data approach was using the data to gain the insights, not using the data to slot people into predefined categories, but use the data to actually define the categories. And in fact, not just have 20 categories, but have a category for almost every shopper. So that it's highly individualized, so that you get recommendations down 
to your particular preferences and you are not slotted into the gardening group or the cooking group or any of the other predefined categories. The so-called item-by-item recommendation system was not only patented by Amazon, but accounts for 30% of the total Amazon revenues today. It's a very significant step forward for Amazon and many others now used everywhere, but they don't know why people are buying the stuff that they're buying. They're not looking to know why. And now if you think that this is just looking and you being used at the marketing side, but not at the product side, not at sensitive areas in the world, then think again. This data-driven insight gathering or data-driven insight generation is now also used in a medical field, helping the most vulnerable of human beings, like these prematurely born babies, who are particularly prone to an infection, and the infection oftentimes is discovered too late. So there's a, a, a project in Canada where they do digital sensors on these babies and collect 1,200 data points of vital signs per second per baby. And then they did an analysis, and they now can find patterns in the vital sign data that with a high degree of likelihood predict the onset of an infection before first symptoms manifest themselves. They don't know why this works, but it works. It's letting the data speak. And that gives us a new look at the world. Now, for that to work, of course, what you need is data. We need to datafy the world, and we're doing that at a level that we haven't seen before in human history. See, in the 1990s and into the 2000s, we started datafying transactions. But today, we've gone one step further. We are datafying interactions. Every little mouse click, every little mouse move may actually signify something. And capturing it and trying to mine it actually may provide value. IBM has a patent. Here is a part of the patent application of the datafied floor. It's a floor that datafies who is walking on it where people are walking on, etc. Um, now, when we have this patent application, you look at it and you say, wow, this is a great application, but what would you do with that? You think about retail stores putting the data fight floor in. Suddenly, you have data about the way people make uh, their directions that go through your retail store. You suddenly have data on how often they stop in front of a particular display and whether or not they actually then take something out of it and walk on and make a particular transaction, a particular choice to buy a particular product. In Ch Japan, um, a group of researchers has actually datafied the human behind the bum of the human beings. Turns out that everybody has a different sized bum, much like a fingerprint. And you can use this to identify people. Now, what are they using it for? They're using it for anti-theft devices in cars. You sit in a car, your bum is being measured, you can drive off. The thief gets into your car, bum is measured, bum's too big, car doesn't start. And here is something that you probably have seen before, that's Google Glass. Now, in the first version, Google Glass doesn't do what I think Google Glass is doing in the next version, and that is datafying the human gaze of what people are looking at. Can you imagine how valuable it is to be able to know what people are looking at, what kind of advertisements really work, because we don't know, what kind of shopping windows you know, work and don't? what males are looking at when they walk down the street. Stop that. We know that. That's cars. But this is all about datafication that is rendering ever more aspects of our reality into data form. And out of that, we generate value. That is economic value. See, in the past, because 
collecting and analyzing data was so expensive and time-consuming, we collected very little. And we first came up with the purpose, the question that we want to answer. Then we collected the data, and then we threw the data away after we had analyzed it. In the future, we will understand that data is like a huge iceberg, where a lot of the value of data is under the waterline. A lot of value of the data is being only captured and uncovered by reusing it over and over and over again. See, Walmart reused all transactional data to get the insight that they had. Amazon was reusing interactional data in order to get to the recommendations that they want. But many more companies move into that direction. Some of you from the payment uh, sector may know about SWIFT, which is one of the world's leading companies in transferring funds, monetary funds across borders. It turns out that SWIFT has a lot of data about these individual transfers. And they did a data analysis, and they found out that the data flow or the data correlates with the flow of money and the health of national and regional economies. So SWIFT now has a product out, a new product, that now casts, that is, predicts in real time economic growth for nations six to eight weeks before official uh, growth numbers are out. That is reusing data that they already have, because the data value lies in its reuse. Now, there's a company in, in America, a startup company out of MIT, called Price Stats. And what Price Stats does is what Swift does, except Price Stats has no data. So how does Price Stats work? Well, Price Stats goes out to the internet every day, automatically, and sucks down pricing information of all kinds of products out there on Amazon and eBay and so forth. They gather over one billion price points every single day. What do they do with it? They predict inflation rates in real time. And here you have their predicted inflation rate, in fact, deflation rate, when the September 2008 Lehman Brother meltdown happened. They saw it. They saw it before anybody else that there was a huge deflationary push. And they and their customers were able to get out of their positions just in time before the meltdown really happened. That is now casting, that is predicting data, uh, predicting uh, uh, inflation rates by using data that you steal from those that publish it online. But you don't always have to steal. Some of you may have a fitness device like the Jawbone. The Jawbone collects data about how fast you move or whether you walk or cycle and so forth. Now, it turns out that the data is uploaded to the company that produces Jawbone. Last year, there was a very strong earthquake in California. And this earthquake happened in the middle of the night, right around 3 a.m. What you see here is activity of Jawbone users. So the activity of Jawbone users in California was coming down because they were going to sleep more and more. And here they were asleep, and suddenly they were awake again. Why? Because they woke up because of the earthquake. So what Jawbone discovered, what the Jawbone producer discovered is that because they have hundreds of thousands of people out there with these devices and they get the data, they now have better seismographs out there than any government agency. And they can predict, perhaps with that data, earthquakes in California at a level and a degree of accuracy that was completely impossible before. Because they have the data, because the users of their devices gathered that data for themselves. And so the, the takeaway here is don't gather the data when you need it. Capture the data when you can, irrespective of whether or not you know that you are going to need it. Now, there's another startup company called Inrix. 
Inrix works out of Seattle, Washington. And what Inrix does, and does really well, is help people drive to work and back, avoiding traffic jams. And you get heat maps like that. They have 100 million customers every single workday. 100 million people around the world. How do you think they get the data of where the traffic is heavy or not? Because every one of their 100 million customers is a sensor. And as they move, and as they move through the traffic, their device sends back information to Inrix to let them know where they are and how fast they are going. So that's really interesting and that's really remarkable until you find out what actually Inrix is doing. Because Inrix discovered that the data is really valuable. So they teamed up with an investment fund because the data of heavy traffic on weekends around shopping malls in the US correlates with sales of the retail stores and the shopping malls. And so they now predict in real time before the quarterly earning results are out whether or not a particular retail chain is doing well or not based on the traffic data that they have. And that's how they make money because they have the data to do that. Or you might have a heard of FICO. FICO is a very large company in the United States that provides credit scoring, telling you whether or not a particular person is credit worthy. They also have a new product out called the Medication Prediction Score, using freely available data about people. They are now able to predict through the data analysis whether or not a particular person is likely to take his or her medication on time or not. Why is this important? Because hospitals use the data to decide whether or not to send somebody home earlier or later, depending on whether they are willing and able to take their medication on time. And FICO makes quite some money doing that. So the next takeaway, therefore, is everyone, like FICO and Enrix, are constantly evolving their business model as they begin to focus on the role of data. Now, there's almost no company that does it as well as Google. But some people might have been stunned last year when it was announced that Google bought a thermostat company for almost $3 billion. And a lot of people went out and said, are they crazy? What are they smoking in Mountain View? A thermostat company for $3 billion? They weren't smoking anything, at least not at this deal, because Nest, the thermostat company, wasn't producing a thermostat. It was producing a sensor that was learning what temperature people liked their rooms to be at a given time, at a given day. Can you imagine how valuable the information is to know how warm or cold people want their rooms to be because you can then use this on a local and regional and national level to actually predict energy consumption. And to know energy consumption and to predict that really well is incredibly valuable. It's also valuable because you know what kind of houses use or are used in a particular fashion with respect to heating or cooling, what kind of heating system and so forth. So Google is getting into this, but they're not the only one, of course. Apple has recently announced the Apple Watch. Some look at this and say, wow, this is a cool time-telling device. Others look at it and say, oh, this is a cool communications device. I look at it and say, this is a cool data collection platform. It has 18 sensors built into it, include, of course, the heart rate sensor, but 18 sensors that just collect data. The question, of course, is who gets the data? Who benefits? Who can reap the insights from it? The large companies, the large uh, internet players in particular seem to move to becoming data platforms. But then there is the small startups like Decide.com that predicts consumer prices for individual products. And they're very good at it. 
They have hundreds of thousands of customers every single day. But you know how many employees they have? Hundred thousands of customers every day, billions of price points calculated every day, and they have 30 employees altogether. And they have zero server. Not a single server because they use cloud services. So what we see is that the big are getting bigger and the smaller are getting agile and are quite successful, but the middle loses out. So you need to find your place in the big data ecosystem. What do you need? See, a lot of people think they need the technology or they need the analysts or they need the consultants. Not really. What you really need is the data. Without the data, it's really hard to do data analysis. And what you really need is the mindset, the understanding that data really holds a lot of value. The consultants you can hire, the data and the mindset, not so much. Now, in the US, there is a company called Target, and they can, based on the data that they have about their customers, predict when a customer, a female customer, is going to be pregnant, oftentimes before the customer actually knows herself. Now, if you think that this is a little scary, then you're right. A lot of people connect that to 1984 and surveillance. Other people look at this and say, oh my god, this is like Minority Report, where they predict what I'm going to do in the future, much like uh, Tom Cruise did in his movie. So, if people get scared of these new technologies, if people get scared of the data economy, then they will zoom out, tune out, leave behind and switch the devices off. The number one challenge, therefore, is to instill in the people trust and to maintain that trust. Trust that the data that is being collected is actually used responsibly and held accountably. That trust is essential, and trust is really a hard issue because if you lose trust, if trust is lost, it's really hard to reestablish it. Ask Facebook. You know, Facebook a couple of years was the king of the hill, but now there is a competitor in town called Snapchat, and dozens of millions of young people have moved from Facebook to Snapchat because Snapchat actually lets them delete the photos automatically that they share. And that's something that they like, and the young people in particular don't really trust Facebook. So trust is essential. Without trust, there cannot be big data. A study in the United States showed that the car that has the least repairs is the car of the color orange. And when you now start thinking, oh my god, why is this? Is this because car owners really take care of their orange cars? Is this because the orange car is produced specially? Stop it. We don't know. The data only tells us what. The data very rarely tells us why. If you give data more of meaning than it actually deserves and has, you fall into the dictatorship of data, and that is the biggest problem of all. You give it more meaning than it has. So in this data-driven world where data is the driving force, what's going to happen next? I believe that big data will help us make better decisions in the future. It will improve what people are buying online and offline to how we manage our financial, um, our financial activities, to how we better learn and treat ourselves, to how cars drive themselves. But what is essential is that we use this incredibly powerful technology that we have, knowing that we remain its master, that as much as it is really important to learn from the data, we also remain humble and understand that there needs to be a space for humans, for, for creativity, for irrationality, for sometimes behaving against what the data prediction tells us. Because at the end of the day, as much as data is powerful and valuable, it is not the world itself. It's just a shadow of it, just a reflection. And therefore, by definition, almost incomplete and always a little bit incorrect. So as we walk into this big data age, please let's do so, utilizing the great, tremendous force and power that data has, but
but doing so with humility and with humanity. Thanks very much.